Hi, my name is Amrita Cottrell and I'm coming to you from Berwick, uh, Maine and you are in our backyard of our home. So here's where we started creating a food forest garden in April. So when we bought this property in December of 2021, it was completely blank and we decided that we wanted to do something to really regenerate this property um, because it had sat empty for quite a while and it was just lawn and just mowing lawn is not what I wanted to do for the summer. So we had um, friends who had had food forests in Oregon where we moved from and we thought wouldn't it be fun if we created an urban food forest here in Berwick. So we started with several months of drawing out plans and measuring and figuring out exactly how we were going to, to lay it all out, which was a lot of fun. We spent That's how we spent our evenings. And so as you can see, it's been laid out into these various sections. So in food forest gardening, you want to do it in manageable sections rather than just the whole thing. And also, I tend to really like things that are beautiful. And so for me, laying things out in a beautiful way rather than just lining things up in rows um, to me is much more interesting. So we laid out these various areas which in permaculture is called guilds and so a guild is a collection of things that have a common interest. So the common interest here is growing vegetables and fruits and pollinator plants. We broke ground first in April by planting some fruit trees. So as you can see there are a few semi-dwarf fruit trees around the property that are sort of our foundational plants. The whole idea behind a food forest is that you want to replicate what's been working for eons and that is the forest. So in the forest you'll see many layers of plants. So here we can look at the layers that are were already here when we started, which was we started with a blank slate, no nothing here except the lawn and the fence. But when I first looked at the property, that tree spoke to me. So that tree would become our canopy tree, our upper story canopy tree. Now your upper story canopy tree obviously doesn't have to be on your property. That one's on the neighbor's property. We also have an elm tree over here in the front yard. Um, so those end up being our upper story canopy trees. Our fruit trees end up being the lower canopy trees. So usually they're either fruit trees or nut trees. We decided not to go with nut trees, but we decided to go with fruit trees. And the fruit trees that we started using are dwarf uh, semi-dwarf trees because they're easier to pick. They only get to be about 15 feet tall and you can easily pick that using a small little ladder. If you'd go with the normal trees, the normal fruit trees, they're very very tall and at my age I don't want to be crawling up on a ladder <laughs> to get the fruit. So the next layer is the herbaceous layer which you can see a lot of here through the vegetables and the flowers. So they, they are the next layer down and then you will have um, ground cover which uh, you can see strawberries, those would be ground cover. Um, root crops are the next layer down which is the, the rhizomus layer. And then we have some vining things which you'll see the teepees there have, um, have green beans on them. The lower layer, the last layer, is mostly underground, but you do see some evidence of it above ground, and that's the mycelial level. So that's the mushrooms and the fungi, which serve a very important function in the food forest. Hi, my name is Dennis Jackson, and I'm in Berwick, Maine. Um, and my wife and I have been putting together a food forest in our urban plot and food forest is based on the idea of creating healthy ecosystems and so 
one of the things that's important to keep in mind with the fruit forest is not to use pesticides because you're trying to build um, good insect populations that are in balance so that the, the very balance of predator and um, other insects protects your, your food and all the other plants you're growing. So, um, and the pesticides can also present a problem to like monarchs, like uh, at the big chain stores, they might sell um, starts for different plants that have been treated with systemic pesticides. And you plant those in your yard, and like a monarch butterfly might come along, and start um, feeding on your um, the nectar of the plant and get exposed to pesticides that are already in the plant. And end up killing the monarch butterfly, even though that's not a threat to your farm, your food food forest. Keeping a holistic idea of um, plant when you're thinking about your food forest, so that uh, you get the pest management part by having a healthy ecosystem instead of relying on pesticides. So behind me here, you can see an example of a pretty large guild. Um, often guilds are a lot smaller than this, but this one ends up being a pretty large guild. And it has in it all the various layers that we were talking about of the plants. Um, and within the guild, I've also laid things out into little sections because it, to me it's much more manageable that way. You could walk around and maintain things. You could walk around things and look every day to see if there's any kind of issue or problem. And also, it's much easier to harvest when you can actually step around the plants. So within these guilds, I've sort of done these little arches, which you can sort of see behind me here. Um, and within the guild, then you have different types of plants. And all the plants work together to make the garden really healthy. Here's a great example. Um, in the back of the guild across the way, we have huge cauliflowers. And the other day, I harvested um, several cauliflowers that were over two pounds a piece. And they were absolutely perfect. There wasn't a bug on them. There wasn't a bad spot on them. And the, the reason I think that is, is that we planted marigolds all around the cauliflower plants. Now a marigold is what we call a confuser. So it's a very strongly scented plant and it confuses the bugs. The bugs really don't like the smell so they tend to not go to those plants. So you can see by planting those two things together there's a synergy that happens. The marigolds thrive and the cauliflower thrives. So, an example of some of the different kinds of plants um, are attractors. So, a perfect example of an attractor that you can see here are the beautiful zinnias. So the zinnias bring in lots of bees and butterflies which help with the pollinating. So it's important to have attractor plants all around your plants um, another example is that my squash plants were not being pollinated and I realized that I hadn't really put any attractor plants around the squash plants so I planted some anise hyssop um, and that anise hyssop is a bee magnet so the bees came in pollinated and then we got pollinated fruit so that's a really good example so we've talked about the attractors and the confusers. Then we have um, accumulators, which are things like any plant that has a really deep taproot, like horseradish, um, comfrey. Comfrey is another one that is a really good accumulator. They have a really deep taproot. The taproot goes way down into the soil, brings up moisture, and also brings up minerals that then are available for the plants to to utilize. 
Um, then we have uh, mulchers. And another good example of that is the, um, the comfrey. So the comfrey has a dual use. It actually has several uses because it also has a flower and is also an attractor. But it gets these huge leaves. So you can go through during the summer and cut down the leaf and just let it fall on the ground. And it, it goes back into the soil and mulches the top of the soil and then it also feeds the soil. So it serves many different functions. So here is an example of the newest guild. It's not complete yet, but I don't know that a garden is ever complete, but it is well underway. So um, we started, it was just lawn, right? So we decided we wanted this, this uh, to accent the walkway here. And we love the color of blueberries in the fall. So I thought that it'd be really lovely to have a row of blueberries uh, across here in the fall. And then we actually added a second row. But before, even before that, the way we got it ready is that we weed whacked this the grass down as far as we could go and then we laid down several layers of cardboard cardboard that has the staples removed and that has all the tape and labels removed and only brown cardboard nothing with any colors on it lay those down several layers of that and water it in and and then we decided where the plants were going to go and so along here, you say there are blueberries here and blueberries along that edge. There's a dwarf cherry tree over here and a little tiny one next to it. The bigger one is Romeo. The smaller one is Juliet. I'm hoping that she'll grow up next spring. And then uh, a Montmorency cherry tree there. And then in between those, we have pollinator plants, which will bring the pollinators in to pollinate when these uh, when these are blooming. One thing I want to also mention about pollinator plants is you want to have pollinator plants that pollinate that, that flower and help the pollination through the whole season. So whatever flowers earliest uh, of the fruit trees, you want to make sure that you have um, pollinator plants that are blooming at that time. So along the sidewalk here, we planted creeping Flocks, which blooms really early and brings the bees in really early, so they'll be they'll be blooming when when the blueberries bloom. So we cut holes down through the cardboard and dug the holes for the plants and amended the holes. So amending means we put in um, some good compost and some uh, manure. We used a combination of horse manure and alpaca manure, which works really really well and then planted all the plants in that, and then used this mulch to help keep the, the soil moist so that we don't have to water as often. So this, this is a really great example of a mixed guild. We still have some other things to put in, but um, this, is, this is well on its way. You don't have to start with a 10th acre piece of property like ours. You can just start with a small little plot that you have and think about the things that you would like to grow. What kind of fruit trees do you like? What kind of vegetables do you like to grow or want to learn to grow? And remember that gardening is always a bit of an experiment because conditions change all the time. So um, just think about how you might utilize the different layers and uh, the different types of plants and Choose things that are your favorites. So you might not want to start with marigolds because because maybe marigolds is not a favorite flower of yours. But there's a whole list of plants that you can use as a confuser. And so you just choose from that list what might be of interest to you. Um, and grow vegetables that you are interested in. Vegetables you like to eat. If you don't like eggplant, don't grow eggplant. We don't grow eggplant here because I can't eat it. But um, but if you love eggplant, then you can grow eggplant. Um, there are certain ones that are easier to plant and ones that are harder to plant. So you just need to do a little bit of reading on the internet. 
go to some classes. We'll be offering additional classes at the library in Berwick. And we have lots of great information, great resources, great handouts um, that will help you uh, decide what kind of things you want to plant and how to plant them, and where to plant them. And uh, there's lots of information out there on the internet as well that serves as a great resource. Mm -hmm.